Black School of Art. By a show of hands, who is new to the school today that's never been here? Welcome, everybody. It's so nice to have you, and it's so nice to see all these familiar faces as well. For those of you who don't know who we are, we just celebrated 50 years of providing fine art instruction for the community. Yes, that's So we hope this is a, a first time visit, but you'll be back to visit us for future events and maybe even a class. So I want to thank, first off, Emerge Gallery, Robert Landon. Thank you so much. I want to thank our staff for putting all of this together and transforming this space for us. Thank you to all of them. here. Um, so welcome and, and thank you for coming. Um, for those who, who don't know me, I'm Robert Langdon. I uh, own and run a merch gallery in Sotheby's. Uh, it's a small gallery that mostly exhibits emerging artists. Um, so this is, a, this is a departure for me um, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, I met Peter probably uh, a year or two ago uh, through uh, his wife Deborah and uh, immediately fell in love with Peter's work. Uh, spent a little time with him, and his, his stories are just are just wonderful. Uh, he's he's laid a full life, as, as you will you will hear today, um, and he's been creating some really amazing artwork um, and really pushing the limits um, of uh, uh, golden paints, acrylic gels, as he's been as he's been working with uh, for all these years, and continues to uh, work and inspire uh, others to work with him as well. Um, so this is Peter Bradley, and then and I'm going to be just doing uh, a show of Peter's work in June. Uh, the opening is June 1st. It's a Saturday. Everyone is welcome. Uh, and uh, there's only going to be a handful of pieces of, of Peter's in the show, um, but I'm hoping, and um, I know that this is going to be first step to exhibiting a lot more of his work. As you can see, his work is very large. Um, there's, a, there's some scrolling uh, uh, video going on, some photographs, uh, some of the events that we'll, be, that we'll be talking about in the discussion, some of Peter's uh, older work, and then some of his new work. Uh, being, Peter's being interviewed by a very good friend of mine, Ellen Martin, and I'm thrilled that she's here to do this and join, in me, join with me today in this venture. I've known Ellen for a very long time. Uh, Ellen and I have worked on a number of projects together when um, I, I ran a gallery in Red Bank, New Jersey. Um, and we worked together in pulling the art community together, and it was a big thrill. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be doing it again here. Uh, Ellen is an independent curator. She curates shows down in Monmouth County. And she also uh, runs a website called the New Jersey Artist Registry which is a fantastic website and a really valuable resource for uh, artists in New Jersey and those looking for uh, some really creative artists. So, I am going to pass the microphone over to, to Alan and Peter. I did want to mention there are posters available uh, that we're selling. Uh, they're signed. $5 will go to uh, the Woodstock School of Art, uh, donated to, to the school, and to the poster for $25. So please come and join. Okay, I'll turn it over to Alan. Robert for inviting me, thank you Peter for having me and letting me paint with you yesterday. <laughs> okay, so everybody knows what this is. This is a hint. Okay, let's turn off our phones. And if anybody except me has one of these, okay, turn it off as well. Thank you very much. So Peter was born in 1940 in a small town called Connellsville, Pennsylvania. And he was adopted by a woman called Edith Ramsey Strange when at three days or something like that. And she saw something very special in Peter and encouraged him to start drawing right away. 
So Peter, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like for you growing up and how early you knew that art was a thing for you? I had no idea that art was a thing for me. That's what we considered art as a thing for me. I thought being an athlete would be my situation. I was on the track team, the football team. Lunch thing, and then 
still didn't feel right to me. So I left the group now and went back to Detroit. And then I got this uh, letter in the mail, a big check from someone called Pearl Scott. Klaus Pearl sent me a check saying, please come back to New York City and work for us. I came back to New York City. I had no place to live. I went to the gallery and uh, they said, uh, here's your check and uh, we want you to buy some groceries in Bloomingdale's. We have an account. I said, I'm not interested in Bloomingdale's. It's a place called Mellon Dondry, which is a great tip, so I went to Mellon Dondry. So I'm getting off the elevator and then one day this woman's walking around in the gallery and she says to me, um, how much is that painting? And I was living in crates. And I said, it's uh, 150,000 dollars to sell by it. I said, good. So I took it to the office and said the person who said, you can sell paintings. So from that point on, I, could, I was dressed up in my Dante clothing selling paintings and pearls at the time, which was pretty interesting to me. And uh, it went on from there. So what was that? Okay, so that was, um, Peter got to New York in 1968, and uh, as he just mentioned, went pretty much straight to work for Pearl's Galleries, which was, up on the Upper East Side, it was kind of a, you know, 77th and Madison, so it was kind of a big deal at the time, and he stayed there until 1975. Now, in 1971, Many of us will remember that was a pretty tumultuous time, the late 60s and the early 70s in America. There were a lot of tragedies, there was a lot of rioting, there was a lot of just general chaos and protesting. And we were going through a lot at that point in time. And so was the art world. Um, the Whitney put on an exhibition that was boycotted and that was early 70s, and at that time, Peter was asked by the Demoniel Foundation, by John Demoniel in particular, to put on a show called, what wound up being called The Deluxe Show, which was in the Fifth Ward of Houston, which was a, a very poverty-stricken area. It was called the Bloody Fifth at one point. So what I'd like Peter to talk about is when Demonil first asked him to do the show, he said, why me? I'm very busy at Pearls. Peter was traveling all over Europe selling Calders and Picassos and didn't really feel he had the time, but when John Demonil called again, Peter said, yes, he would do it, except that it had to be a fully integrated show. And that's what the deluxe is known for now. So Peter, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm trying to think about it. John was a kind of a peculiar guy. And he asked me about uh, doing a show for him. He had done a show earlier with uh, Larry Rivers, which was a bullshit show. Seriously, it was the worst sex edition I've ever seen in my life. With, with what was going on. I decided to put some black people in the exhibition that had never been seen before. And all the white artists refused to be in the show. I won't do this show for any circumstances. Clement Greenberg came in and, and shut the door. Once Greenberg showed up, the flow came down. We did the shop, transported myself back and forth from Houston to New York to Paris on a constant basis. And not outside of Paris to call this place, and it's kind of boring. But we did the exhibition. Didn't know how it would go down, but it was. Uh, Kind of interesting because the people that were in that exhibition had never been heard of or seen before. So Ken Nolan decided he was going to be in the exhibition. Nolan was set it up so that Odyssey uh, wouldn't be in the exhibition. And Olitsky, Nolan put one of his paintings of Olitsky's in the exhibition. Nolan Olitsky uh, refused to be in the exhibition. Larry Holmes was the only white person that allowed it to be in the exhibition. Uh, Dan Christensen did it because, who knows, but they all did it, and it turned out the right way. There's another artist, I don't remember his name, who really had a breakdown at, at the Museum of Modern Art about this exhibition. He really swore out of his brains. Horrible person. I can't think of his name right now, but I can't think of his name. But what was the other part of the question? Okay. <laughs> 
Does anybody have a question? How did you feel about the answer? Was it a response to... Was it in response to the Whitney show that got boycotted, or was it just something that you felt strongly you had to do? The Whitney exhibition, uh, the director of the Whitney, Dougie was his name, he would come to Boston and spend hours uh, trying to ask me to, to suggest people to get his exhibition. The only black artist I knew other, other than who he was talking about was Nathaniel Hunter Jr. And he got into the exhibition. Meanwhile, he camped outside of the Whitney across the street. The old time was going on, which was pretty peculiar. But uh, Dougie was a very strange person. He was scared to death to do this exhibition. I refused to do it. And then he started this demonstration about it. Uh, it's still bad news. The art is terrible. They had no, I saw art laying on the front floor taking us on exhibition. That's how dumb it was. We have things leaning against the wall, laying on the floor. It's just unreal. And they accepted that bullshit, you know, the black artists, because they were delighted to be in the Whitney Museum, which I think is a mistake. So that was, um, that was a very important uh, exhibition people are realizing now. That was one of the first fully integrated exhibitions. There were 19 artists, and eight of them were black. One was a Mexican-American woman, and the rest were white. So that was a... Um, and at the time, Peter said that he wanted an exhibition for the children, that he felt the 10 and 11-year-olds could really appreciate that art because they didn't have any preconceptions yet about anything really. They just enjoy art. And many of you perhaps have seen that with your grandchildren. I know I saw it with my great niece. So that was that was wonderful. Um, so Peter, in 1975 and 76 you were teaching at Franconia. What was that like for you? Very strange. I, I met uh, several students, Randy Bloom, as you know, to somewhere. Um, she was a, a, the primary student in painting at that time in Franconia. Um, in fact, she's the only one. The rest of them were there, but they really didn't understand painting to that point. When they actually did it. And it was kind of bizarre because they didn't really care that much about painting. They had a studio uh, over the hill from everyone else, and I would work all day long, and the rest of them didn't pay for it and they so no one can receive any benefits from the other money at all. That's unfortunate. Um, in the 1980s, uh, Peter's life takes a radical turn. He leaves New York City, which is a huge thing. It's where many artists want to be. And Peter had already been a curator. He'd been associate director at Pearls for six years. Uh, he showed in Emmerich. He had six shows in Emmerich. And, um, so what was it like when you went to South Africa? It was terrifying. <laughs> um, it was just really scary. I, I remember there was a person on the studio. I went to the paint, but I realized it was not capable for me to paint at that time there. So I went to pick out some steel. And there was a woman and her husband had come to the studio yard. And I went to the studio yard. And it was very peculiar. Uh, there was this little black guy that was uh, following me around all the time. And I had photographs of me in the still yard. And I was standing behind a piece of still. And there was a photograph of this guy. It was 45 automatic or whatever it was. The secret police, they were following me all around the still yard. Which scared the hell out of me and was very dangerous. Then one night I was sitting outside, and this is how dark Jacksonville gets. I was just close to a person, and I didn't know there was someone sitting next to me on the lawn. And all of a sudden he spoke to me, scared the hell out of me. I was terrified. I said, What is going on now? He said, Oh, I just wanted to say hello. My name is such and such a person, and I'm an artist. I said, okay, can you speak to me in my life somewhere so to see what you're doing and whatever it, what your art looks like? And he said, no, I will at some, at some point. They gave me the system and said, there's a psychiatrist. And she said, one day we're riding in the car, and this man is leaning down talking to someone in the car. She said, you see that person there? 
It's quite a secret release. They're watching it very closely. Which also scared me. Then we went to this place, downtown Johannesburg, a room where this, with all these um, blueprints were on the wall. And the blueprints were dated in the 50s. And the person who owned the place was telling me he was an architect. He said, you're a liar and scary. This is something scary going on here. He was feeding these Africans alcohol and drugs, and all of a sudden, he disappeared. And two people were killed. Then another time, I was in a restaurant, and the same person threw another person two stories out of the window and killed them. So it was time for me to leave Johannesburg, I felt. But uh, uh, Desmond Tutu designated the piece of sculpture to Johannesburg. It's called the Silk Knot. And it's red, but it's been painted silver. So in, in the 80s, you go back and forth a little bit. Um, in 1991, you went on a tour for one year with Art Blakey. And it was also when you bought your house right here in Socrates, or right next door in Socrates. So can you tell us a little bit about what role has music played in your life? And it really, you've been acquainted with music, it's been important to you ever since your childhood. So can you talk about that a little bit? There's a thing called the Green Book. Uh, it was designed to tell white people where black people were playing in America. My mother refused to have a Green Book, but she had this 27 house, and the train station was very close to us. So major musicians came through our house to say hello, and so it was on, on the way to Pittsburgh to perform. And um, Blakey was one of them. But he was from Pittsburgh. He played piano at first. Then all of a sudden he became a drummer. And Ahmed Jamal was another one. And there were a few other musicians who came out of that situation too. That, uh, Miles was from, he was from St. Louis, but he was in Detroit. They met him in Detroit. The Eckstein, Billy Eckstein band, Eckstein was from Detroit. And Jama Jamal was from Detroit. So all these people came to our house on a constant basis. And uh, my mother brought her father, her brother, to Connorsville, Pennsylvania. He was six foot six or six foot four, something like that. And he was her color, and he had bright red straight hair. He would not go to a black barber shop. He didn't assume he was a black person. And Miles was in our house one time with Blake and a few other people. And he said, you're as ugly and nasty as your ugly black father there, Miles Davis. That's where that came from. Miles never disputed that. What did I know? I, I was a doctor, I didn't know the deal. And uh, it was a pretty funny situation after that. Throughout the years, it went on and on and on. And I saw Miles many times in Detroit and in Europe and everywhere else. And uh, with Aretha, Aretha Franklin, uh, who I knew in Detroit very well. And I saw him in South of France a lot. And we traveled around. And, she showed me a lot of different situations that were going on in the music world, which I was so sad when she died. You know, Rita was a very special person. Peter, when you paint, you are always listening to music. Does the music inspire what you paint, or do you just enjoy listening to the music? I don't know if I enjoy it. I, I, I like music better, better than another person in my studio, but the sound system. And I can actually work off what they're trying to do because they think the same way they think. And some of the names of music is pretty extraordinary, which indicate what I'm doing at the same time. So we, um, before we get into Peter's actual style of painting, let's just go through a little, a few more things. In 2002, Peter won the Paula Krasner grant. And um, also in the 2000s, there seemed to be a renewed interest in the deluxe uh, show and in Peter specifically. Steve Cannon did a review for Tribes magazine. In 2017, the Squire Foundation in California had Peter for a residency. Um, and then in 2017, there were some articles written, and there was one on hyperallergic. Uh, how was the residency for you at the Squire? Well, I'd never been in Santa Barbara before, and I didn't realize how much money was in the world. 
unbelievable money. And um, we worked very hard, and, and um, I didn't realize people didn't understand what FJ card was until I went to California. They had no idea what aiding was about. They had little ladies and little guys doing things, you know. And <laughs> by the time we got, they realized that stretch might be something a little uh, worthwhile. And we had a good time. And um, it was a very important situation. I mean, the, the Square Foundation is owned by a man uh, who never put clothes on his hands. He walked around naked all the time. But <laughs> he died. <laughs> And it was brought by uh, some people that uh, really have a lot of money. And they're doing great things at the Square Foundation. I suggest anyone who get to Santa Barbara look them up. It's a good deal. So Peter, um, today a lot of people may have been reading some articles. There's a lot of emphasis on bringing the black people into the art world, bringing more women into the art world, basically people who have been disenfranchised. Um, how do you feel? How do you feel as a black man doing abstract art, not doing art that relates to specifically to the black situation? Well, I think the price of the thing is bullshit. I think most of the things that they're doing, some of them are, are beautifully done. But why bother? You know, why bother to do that? To you? And just paint. And abstraction is the key to success. The rest of it's a joke. Uh, can you talk about how important color? Textures in your painting. Color supersedes every man regardless of what you're doing. I don't care where it is, or what you're thinking about. Color supersedes that man, and paint supersedes it. That's always true. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to um, paint with Peter just yesterday, actually. And um, the first thing, if we look over here, actually. I'm going to let you explain, but you do staining, he throws paint uh, at the canvas, he has huge canvases that are set up outside the house, uh, they get rained on, and nature plays an important part because leaves fall on them, and the first time I saw one, I said, Peter, there's rain on your painting, and he's like, yeah, so what? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Golden paint is magnificent paint, it's water-based paint. It will stain in certain ways. You can put canvas um, that rain on it. It make a difference. Water and paint go together. It's water-based paint. And the color is extraordinary. So why don't you talk a little bit about how you met Sam Golden and how important that relationship is to you? One day he was um, telling me that he couldn't sell his paint. He had a whole car for a paint, station wagon for a paint. And, um, I said, I'll give you a thousand dollars for it. And he said, cool, I'll take it. And from that day on, I said, he's going to bed. <laughs> and I said, Uh, dark. In 1971, uh, I've already talked about the Deluxe show, but two years ago, an art historian called Darby English wrote a book called 1971, A Year in the Life of Color. A uh, large part of that book was devoted to what Peter Bradley had done uh, with that exhibition. And one thing that Darby said really struck with me, he said that this is painting that doesn't need you. And that meant a lot to me because it's just painting that Peter does because he loves painting so much. Not to please anybody and not to um, add to the canon, so to speak, but just because he loves it. Well, it doesn't pay the bills, but it does something yeah, every day that you do for you. You can go to work every day. You don't ask anyone to go to work. You can go to work and do something you're thinking about without getting paid for it, but you do get paid by doing it. Before we open it up to questions, I'm going to ask Peter one more question that I actually asked you yesterday, which was, when have you been happiest in your life? Every day of my life. I spent seven days in the hospital a couple weeks ago, and I was happy then, so I'm happy today to have this with all the people here. Thank you for coming. Thank you.
you, Peter. Um, does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? When did Peter start painting abstract painting? When did he start doing abstract work? I think the second I came to New York City after leaving Detroit, uh, and abstract. You know, when I got away from engraving and drawing, it went to abstraction, I think. Excellent. Then the color setting and golden painting, there was that. Because there's another thing, Grumbacher. Grumbacher was not doing anything with that for me. It's all this paint to my dried spray to the finish of it, so I think that's where it happened. Carolyn, you had a question? Yes. Um, you said you paint with listening to music. Have you ever done a live painting with live music in improv type of thing? The question is, has Peter ever done live music as a live improv? I have a great sound system and it's it seems to be live. I started to look at them make wrinkles on your face and fire and play a little bit of playing. I can listen to it clearly. Thank you. Back there. Uh, my question is... Can you stand up, please? My question is, um, being in the Hudson Valley, does that influence the way you paint? Being in the Hudson Valley, does that influence how he paints? But I'll expand on that a little bit. Being in Socrates, living in your house, and being so close to nature, how does that um, affect what you do? It helps out a lot. I see a lot of things you now. I mean, I saw uh, red birds today, and I saw uh, a deadly snake yesterday, beautifully colored, deadly. That was yeah, a rattlesnake. Um, and uh, the sunlight is beautiful. And in New York City, you can't stand anything but stone next to you. We have an apartment in Manhattan, and it's a stone, stone, stone. But I'm from the country, so I understand it, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Yes. Um, what made you know that you wanted to be an artist? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. What made you know that you wanted to be an artist? You spent the rest of your life with an artist. What made him want to be an artist? Yeah, what influenced him to spend his whole life doing art? Okay, what influenced you to spend your entire life doing art? No choice. No choice at all. Yeah. No choice, a compulsion. Uh, those of us who are artists know all about it. Yeah? What were your artistic influences? What artists influenced you the most? What artists influenced you? Well, I, I met Picasso, and I met Calder, and, and Brock, and uh, the, the Spanish artists, and Diego, Diego Rivera, all of them. I mean, I had no idea. I didn't want to be a musician, because I just took her back and just went on to it. It looked like it was grandma's, but they were starving with the acting, traveling all over the world like fools, making no money. And I did not understand the money situation because my mother set it up where I didn't understand money at all ever, and I still don't. You know, if I had 20 cents and you had 10 cents, I had more money than you had, that's it. It's not interesting. It's something I can think of. What would you do? What would I think of? What? What do you think of about the question you asked? The influence art and the artist that influence me? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think my my biggest influence was Rocco. Rocco spent most of his time talking to me, and I think he's the one that put me on to the dinner house. I spent days with Rocco at all times. He was a very strange person. And I'll tell you something, I've been around some strange people that have influenced me. Like there's a guy named Carlos, an architect, that I know. We saw the World Trade Center go down together. He's become an important artist. Yes. How do you work in the art business, in the art gallery world? Do you 
Davis. Culture is still the strangest of all. Um, music is uh, the way for everyday life. Um, you know, working at Pearls did, did a lot of things for me. You know, I mean, I would, here's one thing it did for me. It let me know that I had a special sense of what was going on, regardless of who I was talking to, regardless of how famous they were, how rich they were. I knew something they didn't know. Uh, I remember Kurt Douglas came in and he would, uh, and Gert, for Gert Garber, they would never say a word. Because they didn't know what the fuck to say. Simple as that. So I felt like that was. Yes? That was, do you ever um, have an end result when you start a piece of work? No, no end results are in mind. And uh, some things I look at that I have to say that I don't like, I made a mistake. But I continue on. Every day, I continue on. Every day. There's never a mistake. If you're doing it, it could be a mistake. The mistake is you when you don't do it. Yes, Richard. Yes. I'm sorry. What's but your... But every case, it can't be equally good. <laughs> so nothing's a mistake, but so how do you, so how do you know? He's saying every case can't be equally good. He's absolutely right. And I think every day and what's good, I think I, I'd like to be better to someone else. My wife is a great <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> I don't uh, I don't pay much attention to that's good. Did the titles come at different times? Yeah. They come at different moods, different moods and different thinking, but titles that I, I must admit are my titles. Most of them come from great things. Did the titles come at different times? Yeah. They come at different moods, different thinking, but titles most of them come from great things that most people don't understand. You know, but you know I, I know a title today called uh, um, trying to think of it. I say it on saying it. I think it's my song or something like that. Someone wrote it. I don't know who wrote it, but it's a beautiful piece of music. I may not be the title of it, but it's close. Anyone else have a question for you? Yeah? Have you always painted acrylic? Have you always painted with acrylic? Like, what did you use before a sample that came along? Um, yeah, when I became an adult, it's always been acrylic, but I've used other things also. Um, I'm not sure what I use, but I use other things. I mean, anything makes color, put it down. Charcoal can make color, you can put things down. Anything that you're thinking about as a color that you can make sure you put it down on a piece of canvas and make it stay there, and that's color. But any other way you're thinking about it is bullshit. You know what I mean? So give it a try. Just, you can take a piece of chocolate, step on it, and then freeze it there. It's, it's a color. Let's just take a couple more questions. Yes? Did you have a circle of friends, artists, that you copied on? Or were you just, were you working only by yourself? You mean when he was in New York City? Any place. Okay, did you have a circle of friends that you worked with? Yeah, I kind of know the closest person I worked with, and Randy Bloom, and uh, things like that. But, you know, there are people that work on their own. No one worked on his own, Judy Fresh worked on her own. Different names mean nothing. I mean, they do what they do, I do what I do. And you, you hope to get together some kind of way. And if it doesn't happen, you keep going. You know. But I do realize one thing. A lot of famous people have no idea what art is. And I just have to talk to them all day long, every day. The most famous people all of us know have no idea what art is. Yeah, that's a problem we all face. Um, any, anyone else have a question? Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Go back and revisit. No, never. 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 Never
know, I never go back to anything. You know, I, I think maybe still sculpture, maybe sculpture at the same time. I think probably sculpture gives me a chance to go back and say I can do this, I can do that. But uh, painting never. That's a waste of time. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, do you mind that you were painting and visiting New York City in the 60s and 70s? There was the Black Arts Movement that was going on in Harlem and in Chicago. Did you have any desire to become a part of that? And if you would, if not, why not? Did you have any desire to become a part of the, art in the Black Artist Movement in the 60s and 70s? I've been ignored as a black artist all my life. I am black, and you see that in New York, too. But the reality is, uh, I've been ignored by that whole type of situation. My name may be Peter A. Bradley changes me from being Jacob Johnson or something. But did you have any desire to be a part of that movement, or those artists? I've never decided to be anything other than who I am. I've never decided to be a part of anything that exists other than what I do, do every day of my life, regardless of my color of my thinking. Now, I think as black artists, I think we invented abstract art, okay? As simple as that. And because of, because of, tell the truth about it, because Apollo Nair stole that piece from the Louvre. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a deal. Any other questions? Alrighty, and I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you, Peter.